Hi, Sam. Hi. Thanks so much for your time today. I'm so excited to be launching our first ever Chatty Chums podcast with you. You are the face of ethical finance in New Zealand, and you've created an inspirational platform that strives to help Kiwis build wealth. Um, you're like the late Jack Vogel of New Zealand. Um, and it's such an honor to be picking your brain about investing money and how to make it work for us. Thank you. So, and, I, and I'm so old, I'm almost late myself. So there you go. So I was thinking we could start with some questions about your first ever business. Um, sure. From what I've read, you were only 12 years old when you um, started your business in my neighborhood in Sunnyvale, right? Yeah, yeah, totally. So myself and a friend at school, um, we used to do this thing called scrounging, which means on a Saturday morning, we'd go around with our bikes and our pannier bags and look in the jumbo bins of all the little light industrial businesses. And we'd find some marble in one. And so we went and built a little hearth for my mum and dad's um, fireplace. And, and anyway, but the real first real business was it used to be, and back in those days, I'm so old now that in order to get a telephone, were no mobile phones. You just had a, a, a telephone with like a rotary dial that you only have one per house and it was installed by the post office. The post office had a repair center in Henderson, which was close to Sunnyvale, where they used to throw out all the old phones and they'd also used to repair them. So a couple of 12 year old kids turned up at the post office repair thing and said, hey, could you mind if we go through your jumbo bin and get old phones? They laughed because we were so young and they said, oh, if you wanted the odd new bit, we'll give you that too. So what my mate Eddie and I did was we took all these phones in our, in, in our pannier bags and our bikes, went back to his place, we repaired them and turned them into workable phones. And then we would go and sell them around the neighborhood as extensions, illegal extensions. So yeah. people only allowed one official phone, but we would install a second or a third one. If we liked you, we charged you $10. And if we yeah. didn't like you, we charged you $20. Some houses had up to nine extensions, bathrooms and bedrooms and that. And, um, and that's what we did. That was our first our first business. And of course, it was under the table cash. We, our parents didn't know what we were doing. And um, and yeah, that, that was that got me on the got me on the um, you know setting up your business route. It was awesome. It was a, it was great fun. So you were only twelve. How did you even fathom um, to make money like that? I don't think it was my idea. I think it was my mate Eddie's idea. I just went along with him, right? I was his oh, cool. little lieutenant. So um, I, like all great business ideas, it wasn't a new idea. It was just, just you know, borrowed and, and we just got up and did it. And I think that if you look at most successful businesses, very few of them are new ideas. Most of them are just what's worked overseas mm. or someone else. And they just, someone just picks up the idea and makes it happen. You know, business success is 99% perspiration and 1% inspiration, not the other way around. That is so true. What jobs did you do following your entrepreneurial phone line extension sure. installation company? <laughs> well, at the same time as I was doing that, I had paper runs in the morning. Yeah. And then I would um, pack supermarket groceries in the afternoon after school. Wow. So I always wow. seemed to have two or three jobs all the yeah. time. Um, back then, I'm so old that back then you got paid 99 cents an hour to pack groceries in the supermarket. And then I had various other jobs working in factories. I used to assemble um, vending machines, all these sorts of things. Yeah. So whole lots of jobs, being a, a builder and all this sort of stuff. Yeah. Um, and, and until I got to university and then, then I started being a supervisor in a university hostel and whole, whole lots of things. Yeah, heaps of different stuff. So how did you segue into finance? Yeah, it was a, a really weird way. So I trained as... Um, really a philosopher. I studied political philosophy at, at school, at university, and I wanted to become a lecturer in it. And then I tried that for just a tiny bit. And then I realized, no, that's not me. Mm -hmm. So I then went and I thought, well, I'll go and get a proper job. So I went and worked for IBM doing computers for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. And that was going really well. And I was, they were flying me around the world. It was really cool. And then, um, you know what, back then, and what thing called merchant banking or investment banking was starting to become a really glamorous career. Mm -hmm. And in New Zealand, the premier um, merchant bank then was also funding the Americas, the first America's Cup team. Mm -hmm. And it was all very exciting. And I looked at those people working there. And I said, well, they're driving faster cars and going out with prettier girls than I am. 
So I wanted to go into that industry. So for all the wrong reasons, I went into finance. I did it for money and glamour and profile and fancy business card and all that sort of stuff. So I went there. I started out working at a, um, a little investment bank or merchant bank, as they're called in those days. The rest is history. I've spent the rest of my life in the industry, yeah. Amazing. At what point after wanting the cars and the girls did you have that epiphany to, you know, sure. want to start something that was not for profit, for something that was yeah. for other people other than just building wealth for yourself? Yeah, well, look, I think people like me who are lucky in life, and I was just very lucky, mm -hmm. um, lucky with my career and lucky with money and stuff, but you get to a point where you think it's not really enough. It's It's not so... I was, you know, wealthy and and had been very lucky, but I was looking in the mirror and I was saying, look, I come from Sunnyvale. Am I actually looking after the people from Sunnyvale? Mm -hmm. And the answer was no. I was just making myself wealthier and looking after other rich people. So I had a midlife crisis and that was at about 45. Oh, wow. And um, where I looked and I said, I don't want to do this anymore. And so I... Um, uh, Actually, well, actually, was it 45? No, it was about late 40s. And so then I um, took a year off and hung out, planted a few trees, did a bit of volunteer stuff. Yeah. And then I thought, well, <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. And then I thought, look, this is great. I like giving back here, but this is not making a big difference. I'm just planting a few trees. Mm -hmm. So how do I end up doing something which makes a really big difference? So I yeah. got together with a few friends in a pub and my partner, uh, partner then Amanda, she was um, very, you know, supportive. And we ended up, um, the four of us, Amanda, Amanda I and, uh, and two others ended up starting up Simplicity. And um, we thought, let's become a gamekeeper turned poacher. So let's take all that we know about the finance industry and we're all experts and professionals in it. And let's set up a disruptive business, which is not about making money for ourselves, but making money for clients, operators and on for profit. And let's give 15% of all our revenue to charity, to a, to a charity. Yeah. And so we just started doing it. Now, that is not a new idea. There's an organization called Vanguard in the United States, which is the second largest asset manager in the world yeah. who did it. And we went to Vanguard and said, can you help us? And they said, yep. So Vanguard managed, agreed to manage all of our overseas assets and gave us a lot of free advice and stuff. So it's not I a formal like agreement, but it's very, yeah. you know, I think you would, Vanguard would consider us to be as, you know, very much a friend down here, I think. And, and they're certainly a great friend of ours overseas. Then we started asking a whole lot of people to help us. Now, four and a half years later, we have 20 staff, but we have 65 volunteers. And they're, you know, accountants and lawyers and professional people who all mm. want us to do well, to help disrupt the industry and, and, and give a lot of money to charity. So it's a different it's a different business. Some people call it a social enterprise. Others call it a non-for-profit company. We're owned by a charity. So there's a whole lot of different angles there. But basically, it's all about making money for our clients and doing good. And you can do both. Okay, that's amazing. I, I don't know that you collaborated with. Vanguard. We'll come back to the index fund side of things. Yeah, um, sure, sure. Just to talk about property, I read in an interview exactly a year ago that the best tip you would give to a 20 year old who wants to become a millionaire is to buy a house ASAP and the sure. most expensive house that they can buy. Yeah, as soon as possible. Yeah. Um, but now um, with COVID, the property prices have skyrocketed and now you need to be on a six-figure salary and also have yep. quarter mil in terms of a deposit to buy an Auckland house. Um, I feel like anything under a mil is kind of unheard of. Does this advice still hold? It's a really valid question, eh? Because it's so hard to get the deposit together for a house. Mm. So, so the advice is actually the same. This is still the best, best investment you can make. And I'll tell you why. Let, uh, we'll talk about the deposit in a minute, right? Yeah. But let's ass assume that you have the deposit. The money that you're borrowing to buy the house is the lowest cost debt you'll ever have. The interest rate is much lower than it is on credit cards or personal loans. Mm. The banks will also lend you the money if you have the deposit. Mm. So you get to have what's, what's called a leveraged investment at a very low cost. And about every six to 10 years, the price mm. of houses double. Why is that? So well, beautiful. in New Zealand, it's because, yeah, in New Zealand, it's because it's a tax-free capital gain. 
And so that's a really good investment. Mm. The second one is there's only so much land and yet there's more and more people. So there's more people chasing the same amount of land. Thirdly is it's where people like to invest their money because they get to live in it and enjoy it, right? Mm -hmm. So not only is it a fantastic financial investment, it means you don't have to change flats all the time. You're mm -hmm. not dealing with snarky landlords or all that sort of stuff. So it's a very pleasurable investment to have. You get to enjoy it every day mm -hmm. as well as making money from it. So there's a very good reason why New Zealanders want to invest in their first homes. Mm -hmm. You've got a tax advantage. You've got low cost leverage. You get to enjoy it, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and and so so owning a house and buying a house as a financial investment is still a great idea. The mm. issue is how do you get that deposit? Yeah, because it's really hard, eh? Mm. And so I think there are two options here. One of them is that you go and live somewhere that you wouldn't normally want to live to buy a cheaper house to get on the property ladder. That's one issue. Yeah. I know a lot of people don't want to do that. Yeah. The second one is you might buy a really cheap house as an investment property mm. and hold on to it for a long term. If you hold on to it for more than ten years now, you get to get gains capital free and you rent elsewhere or the third thing is you find a way to accumulate the deposit as fast as you can mm -hmm. and that's where KiwiSaver is really useful because if you set up a KiwiSaver fund mm -hmm. you can you put in as much as you can possibly afford in fact don't even put in as much as you can afford put in as much as you can't afford start out in life by putting a lot of money in there mm -hmm. and then it will go in there you can't get it out and you'll adjust the rest of your lifestyle to your income Remember, you always live to your income, right? Mm -hmm. If I gave you $5, you'll live on $5. If I give you $10, you will live on 10 Once mm -hmm. you've started living on 10 you can't live on 5 again, right? That feels like poverty. Yeah. But if you start out living on 5 and you save the other 5 you'll get used to living on 5 You'll adjust your lifestyle, but you'll be saving that money. Mm -hmm. And so KiwiSaver is a great way to save for that deposit mm -hmm. because you can take it all, nearly all out to put the first deposit on your home. So, you know, the advice for getting a deposit together is get a KiwiSaver account started as soon as possible. Put as much as you can afford to put in and a little bit more, mm. right? So for a lot of people starting out, I would recommend they put at least 10%, at least 10% of their savings into KiwiSaver. And remember, you can do automatic payments even more if you want. You can put as much money as you want to in your KiwiSaver account. Remember also that the government will give you $521 a year if you put in $1,042 so of your own money. So there's yeah. some free money there as well. Yeah. And start that as early as possible. And, um, you know, like I tell parents, the day your kid is born, well, you know, the week that they're born, start a KiwiSaver account for them and just put in a dollar a day. Mm. And by the time they turn 18, that should be something in the region of twenty dollars to $30,000. Jack Bogle mentioned that he splits his investments for his grandchildren. He puts 60% into moderate and 40% into bonds. So what Jack Bogle was recommending is you put your money into a balanced fund, basically. Mm. The balanced fund being 60% shares and 40% bonds. So what are bonds? Bonds are really simple. Just think about bonds as a fixed interest investment. So instead of going in and putting a, say, say you put a term deposit on, or say five years for a fixed amount of money, right? Yeah. A bond is just a piece of paper wrapped around that term deposit, a legal yeah. structure wrapped around that term deposit so that you can then sell it. So right. it would be like going to your bank, putting on a term deposit and then saying to your friend, do you want to buy my term deposit? Oh, okay. That's, that's what a bond is. And you can just sell it to anyone yeah. you want to. Yeah. I, I don't know what it is now, but when I was... Because I, I put everything in term deposits when I was at uni because I thought that, I mean, that was yeah, yeah. easy. That was like clear sure. through a bank. But it was only like, what, 3%, 4% returns? Yeah. Are bonds a bit yeah. better than that? Uh, no, they're generally around about the same and sometimes they're a little bit worse. Um, sometimes okay. they're a little bit better. It depends on who is issuing the bond, who wants your money mm -hmm. and how much they're prepared to pay. So you can get high dividend bonds and low dividend bonds. And but most people generally don't buy them or you can get government stock or government bonds. Yeah. And is it quite low risk, would you say? The government is the lowest risk of all because what the government can do is tax you and I mm. to repay the person who owns the bond. So okay. government stock is the lowest risk investment of all. And so they pay the lowest return of all. So, so but most term deposits would return you about 1% right now. 
bonds will return you about 1% as well. There's not necessarily any advantage in buying a bond versus putting a term deposit on. Oh, that doesn't seem like a very good deal. Well, it's just that with a bond, yeah. you buy, typically you buy a whole lot of it. You like, you're buying them in 50, 100, 200, sometimes a million dollars. The advantage of a bond is, is rather than going to the ASB and saying, say put a term deposit on the ASB, mm. the ASB and you said, I want my money back now early. They would say, well, you can have it back early, but I'm going to penalize you, right? Yeah. With a bond, you're just buying it and you, you, you pay the money and you get it and you get yeah. paid the interest. Then if you want to sell it, you can sell it to somebody else without a penalty. Oh, okay, cool. Okay, yeah. so fine free. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Okay. So, so that's one of the advantages of, of having bonds. But typically bonds are bought by very large investors who want to be able to buy and sell these things all the time. Okay, so I'm definitely not at that stage and you would no. recommend... Okay people in their 20s and 30s to just go 100% in a growth fund? Most people in a growth fund, it depends on your personal circumstances and I can't give personalized financial advice, but most people, because you've got the advantage of time, you want to be in a growth fund because you'll make more money over time yeah. because you're taking a little bit more risk, but you don't have to worry because you don't need to pull out all of your money at any one time. Mm -hmm. But if you're going to buy a house, it may be that you're in a growth fund for a long time. And then when you get round to the point at which you're house hunting and you want to preserve the value of that deposit, you mm -hmm. might want to go into a conservative fund just to make sure that you're not going to lose money if mm -hmm. the market goes down or lose very much. It depends on your personal circumstances, but you can go to any number of websites, Sorted or Money Hub or whatever, mm -hmm. and they'll, they've got something called a fund finder. Yeah. They'll work out for you what the right fund for you is. Okay, yeah. that's cool. But as a general rule, you want to be more in growth and take advantage of getting the higher returns you'll get from that. Okay, that's cool. So say, for example, someone in their 20s, they've saved about 50K worth of savings. Yep. And yep. You know, about three years ago, you could buy a house with that, 90% LVR. Yep. But now there's no yep. way in hell you can yep. do that. So yeah. what would be your first piece of advice on how to make your money work for you with when you only have 50K? Sure. Well, if you did that, then you might want to consider buying it with somebody else. Okay. With a friend so that you have shared ownership of the house. Yeah. So you can pull your deposits and then buy a house together. Okay. Maybe you'll have two incomes to help pay that off as well. So that might yeah. make it very affordable for you. You could go and get a loan from your parents or a loan from somebody else. Yeah. which will which can add to your deposit, which you then go to the bank. The bank will always want to have the first mortgage. They'll want to get repaid first before the person who's lent you the money. Um, but you could do that as well. Or you could just wait, save like crazy. And, can we and, save at the same rate as how fast the property market is going up though? Well, right now it's crazy, isn't it? Right now it's very, yeah. very hard to catch up, isn't it? And it's really yeah. annoying that a, lot, a whole lot of people can't do that. But houses won't go up at this rate forever, trust me. They'll they'll level off or go down for a bit or whatever because you just can't get all of this growth going mm. on forever because it just becomes unaffordable for everybody. But even back in 08, 09, the drop mm. wasn't even that much, you know? Like it still is yeah. over time, just goes yeah. up and then it's yeah. a little dip. Like it's a... That's right. Market. So history tells you in most circumstances, the property market will not drop more than about 5% yeah. when it goes into a slowdown. Every now and again, it does. So in the Great Depression, it went down, gosh, 40, 50%. Mm. And in 2008, house prices went down about 20% for a short period of time, just a short period of time. But you're right. As a general rule, it tracks up and when it goes down, it doesn't go down very much. And the reason is, is that as soon as it dips down, people start feeling really nervous. The economy slows down and interest rates go lower. Mm. So it becomes more affordable to borrow. So people borrow and then start buying houses again. So, so one of the nice things about a house as an investment is typically when it goes down, it doesn't go down by much. And even if it goes down, as long as you can afford to pay the mortgage, you've still got a roof over your head. You've still got a place to live. When you own a house, you realize the advantages of not being forced to move. So back to partnering up to buy a house. So yeah. Simplicity is now offering 1.9% interest rate. That is only for first home buyers, right? That's right. If you were on say 60K salary, which is kind of, I feel like it is a bit of an average mm -hmm. kind of salary for someone my yeah. age. And then they've got like 50K savings. Can they still apply for the simplicity yeah. mortgage if they partner up with someone who's already an investor? 
Yes, they could in theory, um, but you'd need to go to our website and see what you could afford to borrow. We tend to be a pretty conservative lender. We like an 80% loan to value ratio, which okay. is why we can afford to do it at 1.9%, right? Yeah. There are some exceptions to that. But um, if you can get together with somebody and jointly buy a house, yeah. absolutely, you should try and, you, you, I mean, if that works for you, it may not work for you, but if that works for you, then yes, you can. Okay. And of course, you have you have two salaries supporting that too, which is useful. Okay. Yeah. That's cool. That's really good. <laughs> yeah. And um, then you just be joint owners of the property. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's how I do it. Because um, I just, I mean, there's no way in hell I could do it by myself. Um, working in media and all. Um, yeah, sure. So there's over 3,000 companies that Simplicity has invested in across 23 countries, right? So um, can right. you explain what kind of companies these are okay. and how they're different between sure. your index funds, like conservative, moderate, oh, is it balanced yeah. and growth and also like compared to NZ share funds? Okay, sure. So if you think about our growth balanced and conservative funds, you can either have them as KiwiSaver funds or investment funds. So KiwiSaver means they're locked in to your 65. Mm -hmm. You do get the government contributions. You do get your employer contributions. So you get other people contributing money into it, but you can't get your money out unless you want to buy your first home, mm. you know, are in hardship or retired. Or our investment funds where you can put your money in and out as much as you like. Yeah. Each one of those funds has the same 3,000 investments. It's just that if you're in a growth fund, you might have more Apple shares. If you're in a conservative fund, less Apple shares. Mm, okay. If you're in a growth fund, you'll have less fixed interest in a conservative fund, more fixed interest. But it's the same investments. It's just different numbers of them, depending on the fund. And all of those funds charge the same, exactly the same fee. Mm. So there's no difference in fees. That's quite a bit different than our competitors who like to charge you more for a growth fund because you make more. They think that they should be able to charge you more. We don't believe that. We think you should pay the same fee regardless of the fund you're in. And those 3,000 companies typically are the 3,000 largest companies in the world. Okay. So, so we, we do it, do it by, by size. And in New Zealand, there are 34 of them mm -hmm. that we invest in. Yeah. And they're all listed on the New Zealand Stock Exchange. And then we also invest a little bit of your money, particularly if you're in a growth or a balance fund, into Icehouse Ventures, mm -hmm. which is um, Icehouse, you know, control about 50, well, are involved in about 50% of the startups in New Zealand. And we've given them, pledged them $100 million to invest over five years in high growth companies in New Zealand. So there's, there's a lot of really exciting high growth companies because we think that they will do very well collectively mm. over time so that's what we're invested in it's actually pretty simple so with apps like share these there's mm -hmm. now there's you know hatch there's so many now what kind of advice would you give to someone who's wanting to do it themselves mm -hmm. in terms of you know tips on what mm -hmm. kind of um, companies you need to yep. look sure. for the dd process yep Sure. Well, look, I, I have a very strong view on this, which is that you should not be investing directly mm. um, at, unless you have a competitive advantage, unless you know something that the rest of the world doesn't know. One of the reasons Simplicity is a non-profit company. We're not, we're not making any money here mm. and we're owned by a charity. So we've invested in the way that we know will make the most amount of people the most amount of money over the longest time. Mm. And that is being called index investing. So not picking any winners, just picking the largest companies and investing in them according to their size um, and then charging the lowest fee. The problem, so you can invest directly if you want to and you can learn about investing. You may want to use it as an education exercise hmm. with shares and hatch and so on. You can also sometimes buy some index funds through those as well. So you could, yeah. you could buy the index funds. But in terms of buying individual companies, well, use that as a learning and education exercise and maybe a bit of gambling money rather than thinking necessarily about them as, well, some of them will be good long-term investments, but it's very hard to work out which ones you would buy or sell in mm. order to beat the market. History shows you, as Jack Bogle would tell you, as Van Gogh would tell you, is that you cannot beat the market after fees if you're paying a high fee mm -hmm. because you don't know more than the market. Remember, you're betting against the entire accumulated wisdom of every company and every investor all around the world when you're trying to beat the market. Now you may, there may be, you may have particular insights or a particular intelligence or intellect that will, does allow you to beat the market, 
but history says that the chances of that happening are very low, particularly over a long period of time. Okay. A lot of people get lucky once, mm. but over time, the longer and longer it takes, the more and more you can't beat the market, particularly after fees, because most fund managers, most of these platforms will charge you fees that erode your gains over time. Oh, yeah. yeah, massively. After this answer, I kind of know what your answer would be, but what are your thoughts about people putting their life savings into things like GameStop? It's like cryptocurrency, right? You can mm -hmm. invest in it if you want to, but it's not an investment, it's a gambling. It's gambling. Yeah. So unless you have a competitive advantage in knowing something more than the market does, otherwise you're taking a gamble as to whether or not it will go up or down. Because who knows? Let me ask you a question. Do you know where the market's going tomorrow? Well, no, no one knows. <laughs> no one knows, right. So you know that on in any one day, 50% of people will be right, mm. right? The buyers will be right, but for every buyer, there's a seller. So the seller will be wrong. Mm. If the market goes up, half the people will be right, half will be wrong. But the problem is, is they all pay fees. So actually what will happen is the sellers will be wrong, plus the fee they pay. The buyers will be right, less the fee they pay. So a little less than 50% of people are right every one day. And that compounds up so that less than, and you remember you have to redo that every day, right? Because mm. you might buy a share and one day you might win and then the share might go down. Changes every minute. Changes every minute. It's very, very, very hard to beat the market. Trust me, I've spent my whole life in financial markets. And what I realized is when I didn't want to make money, you know, for myself mm. in doing this from the jobs I was working at, when I was actually wanting to make money for the customers, it was very simple. You say you go and become what we call a passive investor. You just buy index funds, you charge the lowest fee. That's how you make the most money. So talking about low fees, I guess we have mm. to talk about banks. Um, sure. You're super passionate about how much you hate banks. I actually really like banks. The idea of banks is fantastic. Banks have been around our whole history. What I hate is how much money they make off New Zealanders. And I'll give you an example. I'm just going to pick up some, um, some coasters here. I've got three coasters. We'll say each one of these is 1%, right? Yeah. So you know how you talked about putting your money in the bank before and you got 1%? So let's say you supplied the money to the bank at 1%. But you know how banks do mortgages at 3%, yeah. right? So someone's paying 3% of that, 1% is going to the depositor who put the money in the bank. 2% mm. is going to the bank. You see that? So mm. you say, hold on, I'm paying a 3% mortgage. Every $3 I pay, $2 goes to the bank. $1 goes to the person who put the term deposits in the bank. Yeah. Crazy. Huh? That's yeah. why banks in New Zealand make this 2%, what's called the net interest margin, makes them or helps make them over $5 billion in after-tax profits every year. And that has historically been 20% more from the average Kiwi than they'll make from the equivalent Australian. So the big banks in, in New Zealand are milking New Zealand customers. And then in their Kiwi saver funds, they charge, in many cases, three times what we charge. None of them have outperformed us over the last three years. So they charge you more to deliver you less. So, yeah, so I certainly don't want to destroy banks. And I love bankers and they're my friends and I have drinks with them all the time. And I just... Don't like the business model, which rips mm -hmm. off New Zealanders. So what's your ultimate goal for simplicity? Is it to replace those Australian banks? Yeah, I want, it, want us to be the biggest financial institution in New Zealand. And that means looking after more KiwiSaver money, making bigger returns, yeah. giving yeah. lower cost mortgages and doing a whole, we're going to do a whole lot of other things as well, which we'll be announcing in the next few years which basically we call ourselves a dignity company. What we mean by that is we want to give people dignity in retirement, the dignity of owning their first home. How you do that is you give people choices because if you have choices in life, you have dignity. Mm -hmm. Well, think about the other way around. If you don't have choices in life, it's hard to have a dignified life. Mm -hmm. So how do you give people choices? You make them richer, money. Yeah. Money gives you choices in life and choices gives you dignity. So what we want to do is make the most money for the most New Zealanders mm -hmm. And, and even now, you know, four years on, we started around, you know, my kitchen table four years ago, mm -hmm. four years on now, we're looking after $3.3 billion. Each day we're saving New Zealanders about $75,000 in fees. And each day we're giving about $4,500 to charity every day, including the weekends, tick, 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 tick. Yeah. So that adds up to about $24 million in fees saved a year now for our members. 
and about a million and a half dollars a year to charity. Mm. Now, that's with only 2% of the market share because we're fighting the banks. They're, they're big competitors. Mm. But if we get more, the more and more market share we get, the more and more we grow, the more we'll give back to New Zealand. So that's, that's our aim. And in the process, hopefully becoming one of the biggest charities in the country as well. So what's the 10-year plan for simplicity? We, we might become a bank without calling ourselves a bank. So here's what we might do for you. Right now, we can look after your KiwiSaver. We can look after any investment funds you have you want to save. We can give you the lowest cost floating rate mortgage in the country. We might be able to house you. We might be able to put you in a long-term rental accommodation. We might be able to sell you life insurance. Uh, we might be able to give you what we call a reverse mortgage, which means you can uh, give you money for your old age based on the value of your house. We might be able to do um, kick out those vulture payday lenders who are charging high interest rates. Um, we might be able to do um, money transfers internationally at much lower fees. Mm -hmm. There's a whole lot of things we can do you know Jeff Bezos, the head of Amazon? Mm. He has a fantastic phrase. He says, your margin is our opportunity. Mm. So if you look around the finance industry, there's big mm. fat margins everywhere. Mm. So simplicity will be where we can reduce that margin and give you more money and more choices and dignity in life. So that's yeah. our 10-year vision. Um, and, and, but you know, who knows what we will do when, but we certainly certainly made a good start. So at the moment, your fees are a tenth of what the banks... Oh, oh about one third, one third of what oh, the right, banks okay. charge, on average, yeah. Which is a lot over time. It means that it's about 65,000, the average New Zealander will be at $65,000 better off in retirement using current fees, the mm. fee differential over the rest of their lives. So our aim will be to try and make that bigger, of course, but at the moment, that's what it is, yeah. Okay, that's cool. The average, you're saving our average KiwiSaver member now yep. about $360 a year in fees. Will you have credit cards? Because I feel like personally, despite the alluring points and gifting things, I don't have a credit card because it's I, I hate credit black cards. hole of debt. Credit cards are not a good idea. New Zealanders pay a billion dollars in credit card interest a year. And the wow. merchants that you buy them off have to pay the credit card companies, a big fat margin when you buy something on a credit card. Also, yeah. they can give you some points or whatever it is, loyalty or whatever. Yeah, they all try and lure you into spending as much money as possible. And you think, oh, it's not costing me anything. It, it may be not costing you anything directly, but you're paying indirectly because the people you're buying stuff off with credit cards have to put their prices up for everybody to pay those credit card margins. You are paying more by spending with a credit card long term and in the short term, as soon as you get into debt, you get absolutely screwed. <clears throat> yeah, there are some people who can use credit cards wisely, mm. but as a general rule, we're not going to do anything for yeah. our members that is ultimately bad for them, mm. as good as it might be for our own revenue. I mean, it doesn't matter to us because we're a nonprofit anyway. Yeah. All of the benefits of scale go back to members. So why would we do credit cards if they're bad for them? What yeah. do you think about afterpay i feel like it's spurring on really bad spending habits for gen z yeah. well if there was a stronger word than hate that's how <laughs> i would describe afterpay i hate the idea that you get given something and you have to pay for it later on because once again with afterpay you think oh i'm not paying anything more but you, but you mean lured into getting more than you can afford at the time and the merchant's paying for it the merchant has to put the product value of that the, the, the price of that product up in order for them to get paid up front because someone's got to pay after pay right if it's not you yeah. it's the merchant yeah mm -hmm. yeah so someone pays and what they're doing is just encouraging excessive consumption so i i hate that idea mm -hmm. it's it's luring, luring people into getting things that they can't otherwise afford uh, and then and then making them pay for it later or making the per merchant pay for it later. But either way, why do we want to live in a world where people are getting stuff like that that easily, which turns out to be so expensive for everybody else? What websites, books, podcasts would you recommend for sure. kids? My age? Oh, hey, there's so many. Hey, there's really cool. So look, um, gosh, what would I do? If there were three things I'd do, I'd read The Barefoot Investor, which I think is a really cool book. Mm -hmm. uh, lots of people read it if there was one book I would read it would be that mm -hmm. um, if there was one website I would personally go to in New Zealand it would be Money Hub and then it would be Sorted 
And if you wanted to get more information, there's some really cool um, podcasts out there. Mm. Um, you know, Mary Holmes, she writes a lot of really cool books if you want to understand it in more detail. Mm -hmm. But, you know, um, you know, I like to, I think, you know, keeping it simple is, is really important. I think money is actually very simple. So, mm, you know, you will find, you'll find what you want pretty damn quickly. Um, I just make sure that it's from an independent source. So I wouldn't be going to any suppliers websites. So, I mean, you know, look, you can go to our website and we'll give you an education series with some simple mm. truths about money. Um, and that's really cool that 20,000 people have done that. But, you know, uh, but equally also, you just get this, uh, someone like Money Hub is just a, 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 a mine of information. It's fantastic. And okay. it's objective and it's well-written. It's easy to understand, easy to read, yeah. Okay, cool. Thank you for that. Do you have any other pieces of advice for people who want to make their money work for them? Yeah, yeah, totally. So what would I, just some, in, in no particular order right so i would say don't get credit cards don't get debt set up a savings habit kiwi savers as good as anything and save as much as much as you uncomfortably can right yeah. and 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 then but the other thing is is the other way to save money is not to spend it mm, so right. so if you want to go if you want to find out a great way of not spending money this is going to sound like a crazy website but go to a website called mr money mustache okay <laughs> Mr. Money Moustache. Okay, they no. will tell you how to lead a more frugal and happy life by saving because saving money is actually a lot. Uh, sorry, not spending money is a really good way to save money. Mm. Right. So, yeah. so, so, so I would do that. Um, uh, you know, I get into KiwiSaver straight away and maximize the benefits you get from that and, and mm -hmm. with your employer. And, 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 you know, and, and, and then then I would get on with enjoying life. Oh, the other thing is invest in education. It's the best investment of all, right? So, so don't worry about student debt. Get the best education you possibly can and the most education you can. Um, don't get into debt. Cut up your credit cards. Set up a KiwiSaver account and save as much as you can uh, as fast as you can. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and then get on with doing the best you can in your job. And you'll be surprised how quickly it accumulates. Yeah, it's still pretty tough, though. It's, it's really, it's, it's, sorry, don't get me wrong. It's really tough. Yeah. Do you know what? It's always been tough. When mm. I was your age, it was tough. Houses are never cheap. They only look cheap in hindsight. Houses are always expensive. And when they are cheap, you're too scared to buy them. When the market crashes, you think the world's going to end and you don't buy one. Trust me. Look what they call liquidity, the number of house transactions at the very bottom of the market it, are very, very low. People do not, because they're too scared. People are too scared. Yeah. Look at it in COVID. How many people went and bought the equity market when the markets dropped 20% during COVID? Everyone was too scared. They thought it was going to go down further, right? Yeah. So so, so um, don't, don't think that houses are particularly expensive now. They are, but they've always been expensive. Mm. And they always will be expensive. They'll never be comfortably cheap. Do you have any like personal stories of struggles? So we don't feel so alone. Oh, yeah, no, I, 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 I totally understand. Look, it took me until I was 30 to buy my first house. Mm. And I was in a pretty well-paid job. It just takes a long time to get that deposit together. Mm. And I think that you, your generation lives in this world where they see this Instagram world mm. of perfection, which is, pardon my language, it's bullshit. Oh, it is. It's not, it's not how people live. It's not how, who uh, people are. Yeah. Everyone's playing this, including this invented life of material wealth. Mm. Everybody struggles to own their first home. It is always tough, and everyone borrows the max once the, and, and they get in there. But it is something that I encourage you to do. And even if it takes you a few years longer, and even if you have to buy the house with someone else, generally it's the best investment you can make. I've met a lot of millionaires and a lot of billionaires in my life. Most of them have made most of their money from property. I have made most of my money from property. I'm running a KiwiSaver scheme. KiwiSaver is really useful. It's fantastic. It's so on. But one of the pieces of advice I have is if you can afford to own a home, you should try and get one and get on the property ladder as soon as possible. But I totally appreciate, totally understand that it feels like it takes forever to get that deposit together. But remember that most people in their lives did not, were not owning homes in their 20s. They were owning homes in their 30s. So you had a well-paying job saving for your first home. So did you end up having to like 
live in a slum to save money. Um, sure, I lived in, I had yep, to do like yep, leaky wardrobe yeah. every time it rained, broken toilet, moldy shower, the whole yep. works. Like, yeah, did you have to do anything like eat chicken sausages and carrots every day? Or well, I, I used to live in a flat where you used to like, wear almost every piece of clothing I had in the middle of winter because it was frost mouth coming out in the bedroom because it was so cold. Wow. You know, everyone goes, everyone goes through that. But uh, and, and I'm going to sound like an old man here. I sound like your parent. But you know, those things are also character forming. If you don't die <laughs> and don't get really sick, yeah. you know, the fact that you live in relative poverty for a while, or what feels like relative poverty, you're not starving to death, mm. but what feels like relative poverty is actually very good, very character forming long term. It's so rewarding to reflect back on it and be like, I don't live in a mansion that's Instagrammable or anything like that, but I can still really, really, really appreciate it and have so much gratitude for it because I've got something that was so much worse to compare it to. So mm. I feel yeah, like yeah. that's like a part of the key to happiness is to go step by step, rung by rung up the ladder rather than it, being it, it spotted really in the air and then... This is going to sound very old man and very entitled, but you know i am wealthy and mm. i and i and and i can tell you that after a certain extent there is no correlation between money and happiness in fact usually it's negative Most of the, k, right? between hey, 100 and 200k a year and after that your happiness it's got nothing to do with happiness you might be happier if you earn more money but it's not because you earn more money it doesn't cause it to happen and when you're very wealthy, it often causes misery. Because you have yeah. to protect it. And, and you think that people only are talking to you because they want your money and you get mm. scared. You become like King Midas, you know, sitting on top of his pile of gold, protecting it. And you end up, you can end up quite isolated and lonely. Mm. Um, and, and so, and, and after a while, things own you. You don't own things. Mm. After a while, but you accumulate these assets and you've got to look after them and they're just a drag. And by the way, there are a lot of people who earn a lot more than that who are still very happy, right? <laughs> right. Money, money brings you happiness. Yeah. What I'm saying is that after that point, it's not because of the extra money, it's just because of who they are as people, right? So, so it's about who you are as a human being that mm. determines your happiness once you are out of poverty, once you have enough money to reasonably buy what you need and what you want. The richest person in the world at one stage, John Paul Getty, had this phrase. And someone asked him, he said, what is it like having all these houses and cars? He said, look, he said, you can only wear one suit at a time. You can mm. only be in one car at a time. I can only be in one house at a time. So all of these things actually mean nothing to me. Mm. You know, what matters to me is people, the people in my life. Now, that was ironic because John Paul Getty was a bit of a prick as an individual and quite miserly. Even in his biggest house, he still had a payphone for guests believe it or not but but so 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 what he did was completely opposite of what he said mm. but what he said i still think very valid you do need that first yeah. house right yeah so you have to you have to be able to get into that first house that is the first house you buy will be the hardest house you buy mm. after that yeah. it gets easier yeah. just one more question would be what is the best <laughs> advice you've ever received that's a really good question I think the best piece of advice I've ever received is that um, uh, that it's the people in your life that matter. It's not what you know, it's who knows you. Thanks so much. It was so oh, awesome. Thank you. Congratulations on your first podcast. Awesome. <laughs> I th I'm so stoked that it was with you because um, <laughs> I saw you speak with Andre like years ago and I was just like oh my god you're obviously very practiced in public speaking and it was so natural but I was I was instantly so inspired by you so it's oh, you. just crazy to think that from where I was like fangirling and now interviewing you it's a bit of a pinch me moment like a bit of a dream come true so well I'm honored thank you very much it was you, you you did a great job <laughs> all right have a good weekend you too bye <laughs>